Anyway, what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is the power and the authority and how that it is separated. And, and as I begin this study, I told, the, I told them on Wednesday that I had had a, wasn't really an encounter, but God is just, I know that there is so much more for me. There is so much more for you as a church to walk in the fullness. And, and as I begin to study and read about this, at one point in my life I thought that I was something because when I would go into a situation, like into Walmart, I told the story of walking into a Walmart one, one night after church, and the, the enemy was so strong that night. There were people coming out of the woodwork that were possessed they were making an open show of it and I mean they were it was full of it and as well I was walking around and me and Jordan were just laughing and throwing joy here there and everywhere and at one point I was satisfied with the fact that the demons recognized me but as I began this study I thought if I was walking in the fullness of who God is and Jesus in me and I would have walked into that place and the demons would have started shrieking and running. Yeah. And they didn't. They didn't. And so that's where it really started bringing me about to this is I want to get to that. And that's the key. That's the key for us churches, the continual growing and wanting to grow and wanting to learn more. And <clears throat> anyway, so every day, Every day we encounter people at our jobs, at our stores, wherever we may be. We even have people come into our services, not just here, but elsewhere. We have them come into our services and they leave the same. And there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. So anyway, but in order for us to change, we have to understand the difference between the power and the authority. And we most, must have both of them. So turn with me to Luke chapter 4, verse 31. Somebody got my water, so can somebody get me some? Thank you, Miss Missy. Thank you. That's okay. But my voice, I'm going to have to have something. Uh, Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 31. And actually, I've got all these already done up, so. All right. Luke 4, uh, 31. And this is Jesus. And then he went into the, uh, down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue, uh, there were a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of, the vo of his voice, Ha, what do you want to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all. Uh, actually, the demon came out of him without hurting him at all. Uh, all the people were amazed and said to one another, for he uh, commands unclean spirits with authority and power, and they come out. And here we see that there's a distinction between the two. The people were amazed first in verse 32 by his teaching because his message had authority, and verse 36, at his authority and power because he gives e um, over evil spirits. Now, authority... In, this, uh, in, in these examples, authority is exousia, the Greek word exousia. It means jurisdiction, authority, the ability to implement justice, or delega delegated influence. Power, on the other hand, is one that we're pretty well familiar with. It is dunamis. It is the miraculous, the power, the ability, the, for the force. 
And we, throughout church history, or probably since the late 90s for sure, have been crying out for more power of God. We have songs that says more power, more glory. We're asking God, we want, you know, we want your power. And for too long, I mean, that's a good thing. We do want his power, but we don't want just the power. We want both of those. And um, we have... We have actually been in services, and I know that, unfortunately, I probably have done it too, that I have been, we've seen people fall out in the power of God, and they get up, and they go home the same. Nothing, I mean, nothing has been, you know, changed in their lives. In Exodus 24, verses 9 through 11, Exodus 24, 9 through 11. Here we see something that I haven't even, I haven't experienced in my life. Moses and Aaron, Naab and Abnu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up. Go ahead and go. And saw the, saw the God of Israel under his feet with something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God. And they ate and drank. I haven't experienced this with God. I haven't in a vision. I haven't in a dream. And I haven't in reality gone up and been in the presence of God and ate and drank. But these men had. And yet we see, even though they had the power and they experienced the presence of God. And just a few chapters over, a few days later in verses th- in chapter 32. Where they are the very ones that came. Not just Aaron, but the rest of them came and they said, here, let's make us an idol. Let's bow down to this calf. And they are the ones that did this. Not just Aaron. Now, I don't know about you. I have never experienced that in God. But here it clearly shows that it's not just the power of God. There has to be more than just an encounter. There has to be more than just the encounter. Because we know that there is no transformative nature and power itself. It doesn't transform our lives by itself. It has to have more. So we're going to look at the difference between power and authority. Uh, Kings know these things quite well. They conquer by power. They go out when they send out their mighty men and they conquer by power. But power in and of itself is not going to rule the kingdom. They have to have the authority. They rule by the authority. So all too often, I think, you know, and, and, and even with me, I always put power and authority. When in reality, it's just the opposite. It's the authority and the power. Because you know what? The thing about it is power is recognized once it happens. Once it happens, you see it, okay? But authority is recognized as soon as it comes on the scene. That's why Jesus and, and Matthew, the demons would cry out, Son of man, what, or Son of God, what are we doing? You know, what do we need to do? You know, be away with us. Um, what do you want with us, Son of God? It's because they recognize that authority. So first of all, power, the dunamis power, is temporal in nature. It's explosive. It's where we get dynamite from. from. It explodes. It's done. It doesn't happen all the time. It happens at once, and it's done. And we see that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And it says, um, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. You will receive power. It is that dynamite power of the Holy Spirit when it comes upon you. It happens at once. And the result of that power is the boldness to be the witnesses, to show everyone that God is still alive, that he is powerful, he is real. Okay? But it's not a continual thing. It just happens all at once. But it's not just that. It's not just the explosive. When we think of dynamite, you know, exploding. This power is also miraculous. It's creative. This is the stuff that creates when um, deformed kidneys or grows out limbs. It is the power of some miraculous. And we see that in Luke 1 and 35. Luke 1 and 35 is when the angel answered and he said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you with power. The Most High will overshadow you. 
So the Holy One will be born to you called the Son of God. This is where he's come to, to uh, Mary. He says, here, your son, is gonna, you're going to be overpowered. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. It's miraculous. It's creative. All of a sudden, she wasn't pregnant. All of a sudden, she was. Okay? But the difference with another thing with power is it's a gift. Okay? Power is a gift. You can do nothing to deserve it. Okay, if you deserved it, it would be called a reward. Okay, so it's not. It, it, it is nothing to be deserved. It is a gift. And again, that's found in Acts 2.38. I'm going fast. I'm trying to slow down. Acts 2.38 said, Peter replied, that said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now we already know that the Holy Spirit is the power. And inside the gift of the Holy Spirit, you may be given what's the power gifts. In 1 Corinthians, you've got the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of po- uh, prophecies. But all of these are quick. They, they happen. They're done. But again, it is a gift. And you can choose whether or not you want that gift. Okay? Power, you can choose whether or not you're going to operate in power. You may operate in it at one time and set it down and never walk in it again. Or you can walk in the gift of healing day after day after day after day. It's a continual thing. That's why you see people that that once had an awesome and mighty gift of God. It's not that it's been taken away from them. They're just not using it. The enemy has come and taken it. It hasn't taken it, but they've laid it down. They've laid that down, that gift. Now, authority is just, is just almost not exactly the opposite of it, but it is different. Authority give, is given by God, okay? It even talks about the kings. It talks about our, our government. All authority is given by God. But the spiritual authority, the thing that we are wanting, the thing that I want anyway, is that highest form. Because that's when not just the scene obey me, not just my children and kids' church obey me because I'm the authority, but it is when the, the unseen, the demonic, the angelic realm listen to what I say. Okay? That I walk in that. When I walk in a room, the demons tremble when I walk in authority. When I make a proclamation or a declaration, the angels go and they perform that thing because I'm walking in that authority. And when it, you know, we see this, we see it over and over in the scriptures. But one of the, uh, the best examples of, um, of an authority outside the demonic realm is in Mark 4, 35 and 40 through 41. Here, uh, just a premise, is, is just where Jesus is walking uh, or is in the, a boat. <clears throat> you got it? Okay. So then uh, that day when evening came, he said to the disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Keep going. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now, we all know this story, but look at this. Do you think that Jesus or that God caused the squall? Is he the one that caused the storm? No. Okay, so so Jesus recognized that. Um, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus got up, he rebuked the winds and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Now, if, he, if this storm in his life hadn't come up and the disciples hadn't seen him take authority over the winds and the waves... Do you think they would have ever comprehended that they could have done that? Jesus is our example here. And here we see that even the winds and the waves obey him. I want to be the next time that a storm comes up and a tornado is heading down my way, fixing to hit my house. I want to be able to say, stop, be quiet, peace, be still. And not just for my house, but for yours. Not just for my stuff, but for yours. But a 
Authority doesn't come in an instant. Like power, it's here and there. Authority doesn't come that way. We are all given a measure of authority and power when we get saved, but it is a level thing. We can continue to grow in that authority, or we can stay at the bottom level to where all we do is walk around with our heads down like this, and we, we basically walk in it, and we don't even realize we got it. But we have to walk in it because too much is given, much is required. And if I want more, I'm going to have to keep going. But authority is based on that relationship. Yes. It is not based on knowledge. It is not based on, but it is, it, it, it's a fruit of our relationship with God. In 2 Timothy 3, 5 through 7, you can put it up or not, but we realize that it's not just based on knowledge because Timothy is talking about a generation or people that was coming that was going to have a form of godliness but deny its power. And it tells them to have nothing to do with them. Go ahead and skip to seven. He says, they're always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. So we know that we can have all the head knowledge in the world. I love my word. I read it my word I write my word I love it I want to know the only way that I'm going to get more is authority is to learn this word and know what I've got but that's not at all it comes with that relationship with God it comes with that intimacy that I have to have and we'll get to that in a minute but another thing with authority is that it is greater than power it is greater than power we find that in Luke 10 and 19 Luke 10 and 19, it says this, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to, come over, to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. He's given us this. He's given us the authority and he's given us that power. And you know, when I was doing this study, I didn't realize this, but that Jesus gave the disciples authority before they ever received the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's found in, one of the examples of it is in Matthew 10 and 1, if you're taking notes. Matthew 10 and 1. This is where he came and he called all of his 12 disciples and he says, I give, he gave them authority to drive out the evil spirits and to heal every sickness and disease. So they received the authority to do that before they ever received power. So we know that it is greater, but for all too long, we've always just cried out, God, we want this power, we want this miraculous, we want this. But I want to tell you something. When we walk in the authority of God, and the, and the Lord showed this to me when I was a watchman prayer. This church has seen the power of God. This community has seen the power of God. When the revival happened, the power of God came, and this community was changed. Okay? All right, we had people, the, the businesses I mean, we were ha they were staying open after hours. They were cooking. I mean, we had people in and out, and this community thrived. But once that initial power was gone and that manifestation of the Lord was gone, there was no authority. Because had the authority been here, okay, when we see the authority come into this community, into our county, into our state, into our nation, okay, poverty is going to be broken. We're not going to have businesses going out of business, okay? We're not going to be um, begging for, for jobs and that kind of thing because the heavens are going to be open. The authority of the heavens is going to be open. The finances are going to be different. So there is a difference in that power and authority. If there wasn't, if there wasn't, and this is one of the big thing with it, if it wasn't stronger or more power or, or better than, it's not even better, I'm not going to say that. But if we didn't have to have it, there would have never been Adam and Eve. Okay? There would have never been the temptation between Adam and Eve. It, um, he wouldn't have had to. Satan would have had to come down. But we all know in Genesis 1.26, it said, God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them rule over the fish and the seas and the birds, the air, and on and on and on. That rule is the authority. God gave him the authority over all the earth. And in Ezekiel 28, and you can go back and you can look it up because it's a lot of scripture. It gives reference 
to Lucifer. And he tells about how he was anointed as guardian cherubim. He had the authority in heaven, but he lost it. But he still had power. He didn't lose his power, did he? Okay, excuse me. I'm the only one, but he has not. But he lost his authority. And that's what he wanted. He wanted it so bad. And that's why he came and he tempted them. He said, did God really say this? Did God really say that? And what was the very thing that when Jesus, when, when he tempted Jesus in Luke 4, he said, he took him up to a high place and he showed him all the dis, in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and he said to them, I give you all their authority and splendor for it's been given to me by Adam and Eve. My emphasis. And I give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, you will... It will all be yours. Satan tempted Jesus just like he tempts us. But he set him up there and he said, all the authority and the kingdom of the world. And Jesus could have done it. He could have done it the the easy way. Well, not really easy way. But it was easier than what he did. But instead, he chose to do it the Father's way. He chose to get back the, the authority by the Father's way. So turn to Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Here he's telling us your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus, Christ Jesus. Who being the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So how? How did he do it? How did he do it? He came obedient. And as a result of that obedience, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name above all names. Jesus who led a sinless life, had to become obedient. And the way that he became obedient in his relationship with the Father, in John 5, 19, he said he did nothing that he didn't see the Father do. In John 5, 20, he says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than this. We always talk about the secret place. We always talk about getting alone with God. And that's what Jesus did. In his secret place in the mornings when he got up before anybody else did. And he would sit there with the Father and he'd say, okay. And the Father would say, all right, son, this is what I want you to do today. And he would see it. I am convinced that in his mind... That he would walk, he would see people being healed before he ever got to the situation. So that when he got there, he knew it wasn't maybe or not. He knew exactly what he was doing because the Father showed him all he does. The more that he spent time with him, the more that he began to show him. And it was just like us. It was just like us. Jesus was fully human. We've already read it. He was God. He gave up that authority. He gave up everything that he had. And he came and he became a human like us so that we would know. And, I, and I, unfortunately, there's been times in my life that I have not. There's been things that God has asked me to do that I haven't been obedient. But let me tell you. Obedience isn't obedience if you want to do it. Submission is not submission if we want to do it. It's going to require something of us. It's going to to be one of those things that God says, 
okay, this is what I want you to do. And you're going to be saying, really, God? But I really want to do this. And it's not that you're sinning. It's not that God is asking you to do something or, or it's because of sin. It's because he wants you to be close to him. There are things that we have to give up in order to reach a higher level of authority. It's time that we would normally spend with family or friends that we spend time with God. And Jesus learned obedience, just like you and me. But in Hebrews 5, 7 through 9, So during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he what? Suffered. He learned obedience by what he suffered. And once he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who what? Obey, Obey him. Now, I don't know about you. I don't like suffering. I don't like it. I, I would love to have just a happy day and, and, and everything go just the way I want it to. And I live my life. But things come. And, and I was always studying this and I was looking at this. I thought, you know, he learned by what he suffered. And I just started in Matthew. And in Matthew, I just went verse by verse, kind of skimming through, trying to figure out what all Jesus suffered or endured. Okay, not including fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, which I would consider suffering. Okay, but right after that, before he had any food, the enemy comes to him. Now, I have never even been tempted by Satan himself because Satan can only be in one place at one time. And I'm sure he's not that concerned with me. But he had Satan himself come to him and tempt him and throw things at him. He suffered through fierce storms, as we already read. Faithless disciples. Rejection. How many of you have ever had rejection? How many has ever been through a fierce storm? He was laughed at. He was accused of awful things, even being possessed. He was constantly people wanting something from him. Show me a sign. When you walk in power and authority, do you think that people aren't going to be doing the same to you? They are. They will. They will. They did it to him. And we see in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 42, we know the scripture as Jesus is praying. If it's not possible, if it is not possible for the cup to be taken away unless I drink it, what? May your will be done. May your will be done. He didn't want to have to suffer, but yet he did it. He did it for you, and he did it for me, and he did it so that we could have that authority. And in Matthew 28, 18, before he left, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And we've already read that he's given us the power and the authority. And he's given it to us, but it goes back to the intimacy thing. It goes back to how much of God do we really want? How much of it? Are we willing to submit? Are we willing to be obedient? Are we willing to lay down some things? To pick up some things? Because God is a good God. The enemy is continually throwing things at you and lying to you and telling you that it's got to be this way or, or um, God doesn't really care about your suffering. If you had more faith, you wouldn't be suffering. Well, that's not what the word says. Jesus suffered. Look at the disciples and how much they had to go through to walk in the authority that they walked in. They were martyred. Life wasn't always easy for them, but they, they went out rejoicing after they were beaten because they knew the power and the authority that God had given them. 
And that's, God is just, that's what he's doing right now. He's just asking. It's time. Are the demons shrieking when you come into the room? And again, like I said, as I was starting this, I thought, Lord, I'm not even walking in this. How can I teach about it? But I want to spur you on that there's more. There's so much more for us as a church. We cry out for the fullness of God. We cry out for the fullness. And it's there. He's given it to us. And it's time for us to start walking in it. To start believing in who we are as Christians. And quit allowing the enemy to lie to us. Because the only way. The only way that we can get rid of that authority is if we willfully sin or we're disobedient. Or if we don't walk in it. If we decide that, you know what, God's not really going to use me. Yeah, he is. I want to tell you something this morning in class. We did a, just a praise and worship time and a prayer time. And at the end, we had the kids come around praying for me and Lori. I said, I want y'all to pray for us. And if you'll pray out loud, do it. I had one of the little boys. He started praying for Lori. And he nailed it. He nailed healing. He nailed things that I was just like, wow. All because he listened yeah. and he was obedient. And yet we as adults, we listen sometimes or we shut out the, the Lord. And then we get frustrated. And we can give the enemy our authority. We can. And if you look at the degree that you have in common with the enemy or with darkness, that's the level of degree that you've given him of your authority. I'm ready for my authority. I'm ready to walk in that fullness. But like I said, people, this is not a sermon that's yippee do, let's go. It's something you're going to have to take home. It's something you're going to have to do. Contend with God. It's something that you're going to have to say. God's going to ask you on a daily basis. Are you sure you want to walk in this? If you want to walk in this, then this is what I want you to do today. And it may be the stupidest thing on earth that you think. Oh. And sometimes I ask my children to do crazy things just because I want to see if they're going to be a submissive. And sometimes God asks us to do the silliest things because he's just testing He's saying, okay, now are you listening? Are you going to be obedient to this even though you don't understand? If you're going to be obedient in this, then I know I can trust you with greater things. I know that I can give you more and more. So let's pray. Father, I just... Lord, we just, we just praise you and we worship you, God. And Lord, I know as hard as I've struggled with this, I know that it is because it is your word. It is your truth, God. And although it doesn't make us want to jump up and down, may it stir our hearts. May it awaken us in the night, God. I just pray that you would get, begin to give us dreams and visions of the authority that you have placed within us, God. That we can see it because Jesus only did what he saw you do. So begin to show us, teach us your ways, oh God. Teach us, God. Help us to have obedient hearts so that when you show us and you ask us that we are quicker to respond, that we don't just sit on it and wonder, but God, that we have ears to hear and we know. Your word says that your sheep know your voice. We are your sheep, Father. We would be quick, obedient, and that we would walk in that power. We would walk in the authority, oh God, that you have given us that we would not lay it down. Oh, 
I'm just going to open up the altars. I'm not going to pray for you. Again, it's a heart issue. It's, and it's not anything bad. It's not a sin thing. It's a relationship thing. I want to be so close to the Father that I hear His heartbeat. I want to feel His breath up on my, on my hair. I want to hear when he whispers. But I want to hear and respond. So the cry of your heart is for the Lord to teach you, to show you to walk in that power and that authority together as one, not one without the other, but together to shake the world, to change the nations because we can only do it through Him. Jesus humbled Himself. Why do we think that we have to do it any other way? As you know, we don't close. So at any time that you want to leave, you can go. But if you want to pray, the altars are open. And just ask that you be respectful of those that are praying tonight.